Hello everybody and welcome to this lecture on the story of Sophos Revere. My intent in this series of lectures is to give you enough information from actually uh, drugs that have been developed and are on the market so that you understand what goes on in the drug discovery process. Uh, Sophos Revere is an antiviral uh, that's been developed as a treatment against hepatitis C. Viruses have been present in human history for uh, for a long time. Even before we understood what viruses were, um, Jenner in, 19, in 1796 um, invented the smallpox virus and allowed uh, people to be vaccinated and protected against smallpox. In, 18, in 1885, Pasteur uh, made the rabies vaccination available. It wasn't until 1892 that Dmitry Ivanovsky filtered a, a, a solution or a mixture that was supposed to contain, at least he thought, contained pathogens that were bacteria that were infecting uh, trees and plants. And after he filtered the material, he realized that the filtrate still had the pathogenic material, the causative organism for the disease that was affecting the trees. The type of filter that he used was a Chamberlain filter that was supposed to filter out bacteria. It was too small for bacteria to, 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 to pass through. Um, then in 1898, Martinius Bergerich uh, duplicated or replicated the experiments of Ivanovsky and named the filtrate virus. There is other vaccinations, antiviral vaccinations that, that came online as well. In 1954, Salt's inactivated polio vaccine was available and then Sabin oral polio vaccine was also available. In addition to vaccinations, there has been some small molecule antiviral drugs that have also helped in the fight against um, viruses. The first one that we can talk about today is Iododeoxyuridine. Iododeoxyuridine is an analog of timidine, and iododeoxyuridine was originally developed as an antiviral for the treatment of herpes simplex virus. It was found to be very toxic when taken systemically, so it has been only um, used to treat herpes simplex keratitis. Um, uh, using it basically topically instead of systemically. Another antiviral small molecule drug that, that came on the market was trifluorotimidine. Similarly, it's in similar design, similar understanding as um, iododeoxyuridine. Now, although it is not as toxic as its uh, predecessor, it still has a certain amount of toxicity and it is currently only used uh, to treat herpes simplex virus in the eyes. So it's, it's used topically in the eyes as well. Okay. In 1978, valciclovir was brought forward. Um, I'm sorry, um, in, in 1978, yes, uh, uh, acyclovir actually, acyclovir was brought forward. Okay, acyclovir acyclovir was brought forward and valacyclovir is a prodrug of acyclovir so acyclovir was developed by a burroughs welcome as a treatment for herpes simplex virus and it was uh the first drug to be used uh first to have widespread use um so it was the first small molecule widely used as an antiviral. Okay. The advantage of valciclovir over acyclovir is the prodrug strategy that is used here allows the drug to have a better bioavailability. Bioavailability availability okay now at the beginning of the um, HIV AIDS crisis um, Montagnier identified 
in 1983. Uh, Montagne identified, I think I remember his name correctly, um, identified, identified the HIV virus. Virus, okay, and um, he received the Nobel Prize. Um, in the, received the Nobel Prize in two thousand and eight for it. Not sure why it took so long to give him the Nobel Prize, but uh, so after in, in that same period, uh, an intensive effort was undertaken by the scientific community to find a solution to the HIV/AIDS crisis that was uh, looming over humanity, and. So the National Institute of Health led a screening program and started collecting molecules from uh, pharmaceutical companies and, and academic labs. Some of these molecules were originally designed as anti-cancer agents and were repurposed for um, antiviral treatment. One of them is azidotimidine and another one is uh, uh, stavudin. Now those molecules are nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors and they work as chain terminators as we mentioned in an earlier class. Uh, the absence of the hydroxyl group at the 3' position causes the elongation of the oligonucleotide to stop after incorporation of uh, the, the inhibitor. So azidotimidine, uh, stavudine, and lamivudine um, are all nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Now those molecules, as good as they are, have a certain amount of mitochondrial, mitochondrial toxicity. Okay, so they have some mitochondrial toxicity. So it became clear that some non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors had to be synthesized. Okay. Now um, those non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors will actually still, they will still target the enzyme reverse transcriptase. They will even bind uh, close enough to the site, to the binding site, but not at the exact binding site. So they will bind to the nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors, causing a conformational change that will then prevent the enzyme from binding the incoming monomers and this is how they will stop um, the action of the enzymes. Some of those are listed here uh, in the Viripine, Efavirans, and uh, uh, Dilaveridine are all listed here. Right. So so this is this is just one of the strategies. Uh, the the reverse transcriptase is just one of the targets. It's just one of the targets, but there are other targets that can um, that can be looked at. Just a brief note here: if a virus was uh, brought on the market by Merck, I think it's uh, good to mention that. Um, I believe it was uh, Rescriptor here was um, Pfizer. Pfizer in collaboration with another company called Upjohn, so Upjohn Pfizer. Um, and then we've already mentioned uh, Neviripine, a uh, Viramune. Um, that's also a, um, a non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitor. And they were brought on the market by uh, Boringer Ingelheim. Boringer Ingelheim. Okay, so these are some of the drugs that are available. Now let's pick up the pace here. Uh, protease inhibitors are another, uh, really a revolutionary class of drugs that uh, came on the market. And the protease inhibitors um, inhibit the protease, which is the enzyme that breaks the virus polyprotein peptide bonds via hydrolysis. And so it, 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 the protease is going to break down the, polypro the polyprotein and release uh, the HIV uh, variants. Okay, it's going to release uh, the HIV variants. So what the protease inhibitors will do, they will inhibit that particular enzyme. And you have sequinavir, sequinavir, 
is uh, um, is an is a drug that was that was synthesized uh, by a by a rush. And uh, the runavir is another one of these drugs that work as a protease inhibitor. Okay. Now there are other mechanisms, as I was mentioning, uh, to inhibit that uh, to inhibit an enzyme. So, in, in particular, for the HIV, HIV has a HIV has a, has an enzyme um, called an integrase. Okay. It's called an integrase, and the role of the integrase is um, um, let me write it here. So, uh, so it's a retroviral integrase. Okay, so it's an enzyme that is going to integrate as its name indicate, is going to integrate um, the DNA of the genetic information of the virus into, into the whole cell. Okay, so the integrase is, is going to to form covalent bonds between the DNA, the genetic material of the virus, into the whole cell. Well, Tegravir is a molecule that works as an integrase inhibitor. So it prevents that enzyme from creating those covalent bonds and uh, integrating the DNA of the virus into, um, into the DNA of the, the whole cell. Okay. Now another strategy that is used is um, CCR4, CCRF. I'm mean, sorry, CCR5 inhibitors. CCR5 inhibitors. Um, so Moraviroc is a CCR5 inhibitor. CCR5 inhibitor. So just a little bit of background here. Um, CCR5s, um, CCR5 inhibitors are small molecules and, and small molecules that are going to uh, antagonize. I guess I should call it a CCR5 antagonist, not an inhibitor. Antagonist. Okay. So the CCR5 itself is a receptor. Okay, so it's a receptor. Is involved in the process by which um, HIV enters the cell. So it's involved in the process by which HIV enters the cell. And so CCR5 and, and there's another receptor, CXCR4, are the two receptors, the main receptors that are involved in HIV entry uh, into CD4 cells helper T cells, okay? Now, they belong to the G protein couple receptors, G protein couple receptor family. Okay, so you understand how these, these receptors work. So what Moravirk is going to do is, it's going to, to, to bind on the surface of the cell where the uh, ligand is going to bind and is going to serve as an antagonist, is going to prevent um, prevent binding or interaction of the um, HIV with the CCR5 and, 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 and prevent HIV from entering into the cell. All right, let's keep going here. Uh, influenza antiviral drugs. There are two kinds of influenza antiviral drugs. Um, there are the ad Adamantans, Adamantans, or Adamantanes. I've been speaking a lot of French lately and I can't seem to speak English anymore for some reason. And then you have 
of the neuraminidase inhibitors. Neuraminidase inhibitors. Okay, so those are two classes of drugs that are available for um, influenza antiviral drugs. As a pharmacist, I have rarely dispensed any of, of the amantadine and the remantadine. So amantadine and remantadine are actually uh, M2 ion channel inhibitors. And they are going to... Uh, they're going to block the uh, viral encoding, viral encoding inside of the cell. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the neuraminidase inhibitors, um, which are uh, Tamiflu of dispensed relenza don't recall but it's been a little bit of it's been a little bit of time so the neuraminidase inhibitors um, the influenza neuraminidase um, is, is one of two major glycoproteins that are actually located on on uh, the, the virus membrane envelope so you have the neuraminidase and you have the hemagglutinin um, that's why when you when you hear about influenza viruses, you have the neuraminidase part of it, and then you have the hemagglutinin, and that's how we come up with N1H1 or N1H5, okay? So, um, the drugs that I, are neuraminidase inhibitors are um, Tamiflu and Rolanza, okay? Now, those drugs are important. They, they, work, they work better than amantadine and, and remantadine for the treatment of influenza A and B. And um, it was discovered by, Tommy for what discovered by Gilead. Discovered by Gilead. And um, then uh, Zanamivir relenza is, uh, was discovered by Biota Holdings. And there are both neuraminidase inhibitors. Let me move quickly here to hepatitis B drugs. Hepatitis B drugs. So we just want a brief survey of some of the drugs that are currently available in the market for antiviral drugs before we jump into uh, the story of sofosbuvir. So hepatitis B virus is a virus that causes hepatitis in, in both humans and animals. Uh, the types of drugs that have been used to treat it are interferons and nucleotides, nucleosides. Interferons are non-specific, and they are uh, poorly tolerated. Poorly tolerated, they require parenteral administration, and it can also be very expensive. Okay, it can be very expensive and when it comes to the nucleotides there are a few of them that are available um, lamivudine that we saw earlier in an earlier slide was the first oral antiviral for hpv and i would like for you to start noticing the trend you you discover an antiviral drug and you you start to find out that those drugs can, can sometimes have broad spectrum antiviral activity okay so Initially, lamivudine was discovered for the treatment of uh, HSV. Now we see that it's also available for the treatment of HBV here. Now, tenofovir, tenofovir, uh, yes, I have it here. Tenofovir is present here as a uh, tenofovir fumarate. It's present as a pro-drug type of strategy. Okay, uh, acyclovir, uh, not acyclovir, adefovir. Is also present as a pro-drug type of strategy. Uh, Telbivudine, anticovir, and ribavirin. Ribavirin is one of these drugs that is present in the treatment cocktail for many different drugs. Now, tenofovir is a an, 
nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitor that's used in the treatment of both HBV and HIV. Okay, so treatment of both HBV and HIV. Now, uh, ribavirin is used in H. BV is also used in HCV. Okay. Now, when you look at these drugs, the way they are um, they are designed, and we talked about the the pro drug strategy. Um, so, b talking about tenofovir, for instance, uh, tenofovir um, is designed as a fumarate um, fumarate pro drug because it enhances its bioavailability. Now inside of, of the body it starts to be it starts to be hydrolyzed. First you have you have um, hydrolyzation caused by carboxyesterase and that's going to release is going to release um, so when when the when the drug originally is synthesized you are going to have um, you are going to have also propanol um, isopropanol and a carboxylate so isopropanol and a carboxylate so the first the first thing that happens is is a hydrolysis that takes place and um, that hydrolysis is going to to liberate one molecule of isopropanol and a carboxylate then it's going to you're going to see a spontaneous release of carbon dioxide followed by a spontaneous release um, a spontaneous release of formaldehyde okay and then the same process that took place for this side of the molecule is then going to take place for the other side of the molecule to liberate the active pharmaceutical ingredient okay so that's that's the pro drug strategy uh, for these uh, for these drugs now let's focus now on hepatitis C. Um, hepatitis C can damage the liver, especially when it's chronic. It can lead to cancer, can lead to liver carcinoma or liver failure. Hepatitis C has 10 proteins and three of those proteins are structural. These are the structural proteins. Uh, they're called structurals because they're the protein that hold the virus together. Uh, the capsid, the glycoprotein and the envelope. Uh, the capsid and the envelope glycoprotein here and then you have the non-structural proteins um, they are non-structural but they have some functional roles that they play inside of the cell and all of these particular proteins can be a target of therapy um, of particular interest to us are ns3 which is uh, uh, which is uh, a serine protease and um, so NS3 can be a target. Then you have cofactors. You have cofactors such as NS4, NS4, NS4A, and NS4B. Um, and then you have NS5A. NS5A is actually um, can 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 be targeted. And then you have NS5B, which is the target of um, Sovaldi. So before Sovaldi was put on the market, which is the the brand name for Sofosbuvir. Interferon was being used and ribavirin was being used. Again, ribavirin is not very specific, okay? It's not very spe specific. And ribavirin actually um, can also prevent um, can also prevent or attack the actual host. Okay, it can interfere with the host um, um, host synthesis of oligo oligonucleotides okay host synthesis of uh, of oligos now interferon we've mentioned before expensive okay and there's toxicities associated with it and so uh creating new treatments was important now while the treatment while treatment to target NS5B is important, I want to mention some other treatments that have already that have been developed to treat um, hepatitis C. Okay, so the treatments that I will mention to you are a serine proteases inhibitor. So these are serine protease inhibitors. They were approved by the FDA in 2011. Um, 2011. So 
Bocipravir is a certain protease inhibitor, okay? It was brought on the market by uh, Sharing Prow and Merck. And this, these, these are simply for you to, to, to start thinking about the names that keep coming back in, in those uh, processes of drug discovery. And then Tolaprevir, um, Tolaprevir was brought on the market by Vertex, I believe is how you spell it, Vertex. Uh, Simeprevir is another one of these drugs, um, and that's Jensen's, Jensen's. Now, all these here are protease inhibitors. So these are protease inhibitors. Inhibitors. And NS5, Suvaldi is a NS5B inhibitor. Okay, so let's take a, a deeper dive into the story of uh, Sofosuvir. Um, so when you look at Sofosuvir, it is synthesized as a prodrug. It has a prodrug strategy. The reason being is there is a very there's a very slow step in the conversion. I, I guess I should call it a rate limiting step in the conversion of a nucleoside to a nucleotide. Okay, so the nucleoside uh, does not have the the phosphate. Uh, so it requires a kinase to convert the molecule to a monophosphate. So um, studies were done um, to, to prove that this particular nucleoside had some activity. However, when you would put it in the cell, uh, this process was, was way too long. So in order to facilitate uh, or to increase bioactivity, the pro the protide strategy, a protride strategy was used, where a prodrug strategy is used uh, to increase bioavailability. Bioavailability. Okay, so this allows us to bypass the initial kinase reaction, and and then the once you have a a a phosphorus group here, a phosphate group here, the phosphorylation by um, uridine, uridine, uh, I believe it's uridine, yeah, so you, you go first from one to, so you have uridine monophosphate kinase, and then you're going to have uh, diphosphate kinase I believe yeah and those will convert it to the triphosphate um, active ingredient here active pharmaceutical ingredient okay. all right now let's take a look at how this actually takes place inside of the body. So a uh, Sovaldi, you know, Sovaldi in the body is converted to corresponding carboxylic acid 36, okay, um, under the influence of human catepsin. So that's human catepsin. Okay. Human catepsin A and carboxyesterase 1. Boxy esterase one. So so first of here is going to be converted to carboxylic acid 36. Okay. Now carboxylic acid 36 is going to undergo a fast non-enzymatic intramolecular nucleophilic attack to form a cyclic anil phosphate intermediate. Okay, so it's going to undergo a a um uh, a non-enzymatic intramolecular nucleophilic attack, and then it's going to form a cyclic alanyl phosphate intermediate, which is 37. Now, this alanyl phosphate intermediate is then going to undergo hydrolysis. It's going to undergo hydrolysis, okay, of the cyclic phosphate to a linear phosphate 
to give us carboxylic acid 38. Okay, it gives us carboxylic acid 38, and it, the whole process, the whole process from the fastenosmatic intramolecular uh, nucleophilic reaction to the hydrolysis is going to cause the release of um, a, molecule, a molecule of phenol. All right. Now, carboxylic acid 38 is going to be further hydrolyzed by histidine triad nucleotide binding protein, which is um, a very really related hint. Uh, so it's going to be hydrolyzed by histidine triad nucleotide binding protein 1 enzyme to form a monophosphate, monophosphate nucleotide. The monophosphate nucleotide is then going to be converted to a diphosphate nucleotide. And then the diphosphate nucleotide will be converted to a triphosphate nucleotide. It is a triphosphate nucleotide that has the uh, the activity. Now, a brief conversational structure activity relationship here of sulfosbuvir. As you notice, um, I'm not including the in the synthesis of the molecule, obviously, there were conversations about the position of the methyl group, the orientation of um, of the substituent at the uh, two prime position. Okay, um, and uh, the the way so fossil view works, the way so fossil view works is it's incorporated as a nucleotide into the growing chain of the oligo. However, there is a steric hindrance that is caused by the substituent at the two prime position that prevent, uh, prevent the that prevent the incoming nucleotide from reacting with the three prime hydroxyl. So although sulfosfovir has a three prime hydroxyl, it still works as a chain terminator because of a steric hindrance that occur, causing uh, preventing the incoming nucleo nucleotide from interacting and binding, interacting with the three prime hydroxyl. So in the synthesis or the development of the drug, um, that part of the structure activity relationship obviously was important. In this particular slide, I would like to focus on position R1 and R2. So the structure activity relationship focuses mainly on the pro-drug strategy that was used for the development of these molecules. Um, R1 had multiple possible substituents and R2 also had multiple possible substituents. There's two things to keep in mind, the EC90 and the inhibition of cellular RNA replication. So this is, an, this is a measure of the cytotoxicity. How does it affect the host cell? Okay, so the lower the number, the better. So when you look at these different substituents, um, even, if, even without looking at the efficacy, so this is, if this is a measure of toxicity, toxicity, and this is a measure of efficacy. Okay, so when you look at these, 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 different, um, these different possible substituents here, look at these different substituents here, you have to first do no harm, right? You have to make sure that you don't kill the patient while, you, while you're trying to, to treat them. So these compounds here, although they, have, they may have great efficacy, Let me just cross it over instead. Uh, let me just cross that out instead of. Uh, uh, okay. So these compounds here have great efficacy, but they're toxic to the cell. So I'm going to cross this line out. I'm totally missing it. Not even able to cross it out. All right. Uh, then you look at this here as well. Um, 66 percent okay so we're gonna we're gonna cross that out as well 41 O is gone um, 41 N 
41M. I'm not sure if you if you notice a pattern. Those molecules that have that level of toxicity oftentimes have a halogen presence in them. They have a halogen presence. So there was a pattern of molecules with halogens at the R2 position that were toxic. So moving forward, most of those molecules were um, most of those molecules were eliminated or not pushed to um, not pushed to the next step because of the potential toxicity. That so so they were eliminated. Then the next step was okay. The the ones that are toxic were removed. Then let's look at those that that are that have efficacy. So if we if we remove those that are toxic, let's look at those that have efficacy. From those that have efficacy, 41A and 41I were retained to move forward. Now, if you were if you were simply looking at the safety profile, you look at 41A, 41A has a better safety profile because you have 0% here, okay? 41I, you have 25.9%. But the other thing you need to look at is how much of 41A uh, needs to be given, needs to be given in order to have an effect. Uh, it's almost a um, one to three ratio here. So you have to give three times the amount of 41A to get the same effect as 41I. So moving forward, the company decided to uh, go ahead with 41I as the the drug that would be uh, moved to the market. So as we're looking through the structure activity relationship here, I want you to think about all the different possibilities. There are some other drugs that could have been used here. And I know we say that the halogens were not used because of possible toxicities, but look at this here. Look at 41, 41G, uh, toxicity, it was non-existent. Uh, as far as the efficacy, efficacy was right there. So there are other potential, there are other potential um, drugs that maybe could have been developed from this study and pushed towards the treatment of HCV. The good thing with these pharmaceutical companies is they, they, they barely throw anything away. They probably have a library of these compounds that are still available. And in a time of crisis, such as the, the current crisis that we have, they will throw that library of compounds against uh, the proteins that that of, of COVID-19 and see which one of those is actually going to have it, any type of effect against um, against the disease. So 41 and 41 I uh, were moved to the next phase as well. One of the reasons why is because they had the highest plasma concentration. They have the highest plasma concentration in animal studies. So that was one of the reasons to move them forward. So talking about the metabolism, earlier when we looked at the drug and what it went through to become an active compound, an active drug, um, we, we omitted in the discussion the competing metabolism paths. Okay, So we took a look at the drug from here, and then once it got to... Uh, to the monophosphate nucleotide, we mentioned how the kinases were going to move it to the actual drug and have the triphosphate. In competition with activation of the drug, you also have metabolism that's, that's working to make the drug uh, more likely to be uh, eliminated or excreted. These types of metabolism studies are, are done by uh, using a uh, C14 carbon, C14 carbon. So you basically radio label uh, the carbon in the molecule so that you can actually follow their path in different organs and, and, and measure the concentration um, when they're excreted. So as far as metabolism is concerned, you have the glucuronidation that takes place and you also have a competing uh, sulfation that takes place as well. So both of those are going to be um, both of those are going to be uh, possible for the metabolism of of this drug. And sofosfavir has 
at, at the time of the writing of the book had very little toxicities um and it's and when you think about the type of drugs that you were comparing so far year to you're talking about ribavirin or interferon peg uh pegylated interferon um so far as had comparatively comparatively speaking to those drugs had a toxicity profile that was much much better all right so uh, this is a scheme that shows you how so beer was actually uh, discovered and this is a synthetic route of the synthesis of sofosbuvir. Uh, so as a starting material, um, cytidine was chosen. And uh, so the aniline on cytidine, which, which is position 44, the aniline on cytidine was uh, benzoylated, was benzoylated first. Uh, by treatment, it was benzoylated first, uh, and then uh, the the five prime and the three prime position were protected by treatment with tetraisopropyl diciloxane one three diacylyl chloride. Okay, this right here. So first you protect. Uh, the aniline and then the three prime and the five prime position were protected, uh, which will allow us to then um, transform that two prime position here. Okay. So the only exposed alcohol um, here was then oxidized using sworn like conditions to afford a ketone. So this will give you a ketone here. And then after the ketone was. Uh, was produced, then the ketone was treated with uh, metal lithium to produce a tertiary alcohol. So, treated with metal lithium to produce tertiary alcohol. So, this will give you a ketone, okay, and then treated with metal lithium to produce a tertiary alcohol, okay. Now, um, the TIDPS group, the TIDPS group is then going to be deprotected by treatment with with TBAF, okay, treatment with TBAF, which is tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride and concentrated acetic acid. So uh, in this case, they're taking no chances, absolutely no chances. Acidic conditions will deprotect this group. Uh, TBAF will deprotect this group. So they're taking no chances. They want the group off. Um, and after this this is deprotected, then another benzoylation takes place. The exposed alcohols are going to be reprotected with benzoyl esters uh, to give the intermediate 47. Okay. Now, one of the reasons why this is done as well is if you have any fluoride in the solution, okay, any compound that's going to have an F in it, that compound has the ability to deprotect a silyl protected alcohol. So what is happening in this step is we are replacing uh, the silyl protection with a benzoyl protection because the next reaction is going to be the DAST reaction to incorporate, um, it's, it's going to be the DAST reaction, okay, to allow us to uh, put the F and the methyl group here. Okay, so uh, so we're going to treat the tertiary alcohol with diethyl amino sulfur trifluoride, which is going to allow us to have the fluorinated product 48. Not only does it give us the fluorinated product 48, but it gives us that product with inversion of configuration. Now the yield is not really great. It's a 15 to 20 percent types of yield. Um, because there is also E1 elimination of the alcohol that can that can, that can take place and give us a um, a major major byproduct. Okay, and finally you have deamination by refluxing, deamination by refluxing, um, 
the immunization by refluxin in 80% acetic acid, followed by removal of the benzoyl protecting groups here, give us compound uh, 6206. Now, compound 6206 then is going to be converted to the prodrug. Compound 6206 is, is then going to be converted to the prodrug. Now, there are other um, there are other mechanisms or there are other reactions that are available to obtain the to obtain this compound here. But for the sake of our lecture, we are only going to focus on the discovery um, on the discovery process. Um, all right, so let me see here. Okay, so let's talk about how sixty two. Is is going to be converted to 60, 63 here. Okay, so how 62 and and this compound here are going to give us 63. Okay, so the isopropyl ester of of uh, of alanine, so isopropyl ester of alanine here, um, is going to be coupled with phenyl phosphoryl dichloridate. Okay, phenyl phosphoryl dichloridate here. So the coupling takes place, and I'm sorry you can't see the rest of the structure here. Um, so the coupling takes place, and then once the coupling takes place, it gives you compound 63. Okay, compound 60, 63 is is synthesized, and let me just draw this so that it's it's easier for you to see. So you have CH3 and CH3 here. Okay. So the phosphoryl chloride 63 um, is, is synthesized. Now the phosphoryl chloride 63 uh, is then going to be installed on the parent drug PS6206 uh, using the similar strategy. It's going to be, yeah, n methylimidazole It's going to be uh, used to install compound 63 on the parent drug. And at this point, you have a diastereomeric mixture. Okay. Now, PrEP HPLC is going to be used to resolve, um, to separate, to separate those diastereomers. Let me quickly go back and finish that slide here. To separate those diastereomers. Okay. Now. Um, so this is the story of Sofosbevir. So some of the questions that I will ask you on an exam would be, um, for instance, how are you able to uh, how are you able to to separate the diastereomers of um, of Sofosbevir? How how do you resolve this mixture here? Another question that I've asked in the past was. Um, I, I can give you a similar type of reaction and ask you to provide the reagents that will take you from one step to the next. I've also been known to ask students to propose a, uh, a reasonable mechanism of action to convert 44 to 45 or, four, or 46 to 47. Um, other types of questions giving, giving you this molecule here asking you what are the what are the metabolic steps that are involved in the elimination of sofosbuvir uh, um, but giving you this table here um, on an exam I've, I've asked students to explain for instance why 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 41a was chosen 41i was chosen uh, which one of these drugs is the safest which one is has more, the most efficacy, and so on and so forth. So there are many different questions that could be asked. Um, one of the purpose of these lectures is to help you as you as you start preparing for your as you start preparing for your um, capstone project to think in terms of how do I how do I think about my project. In this particular case, the, there was a particular disease. They looked at a biological target, they designed the drug, they tested it, 
It realized that the drug didn't have good bioavailability, so they used a pro-drug strategy to incorporate the, the drug, uh, to incorporate in the drug and allow the drug to be more bioavailable. All right. Anyway, so this concludes this lecture here. Uh, most of the material was taken from Jack G. Jack Lee, Top Drugs, their history, their pharmacology, their synthesis from Oxford University Press, 2015. All right.